We're going to um, continue the, with our program this morning with, um, yeah, Toby Walsh. He's a professor from the University of New South Wales. He's going to talk about what AI can and cannot do. That's correct. So let's give him a warm round of applause. Good morning. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good, good morning, Seabit. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. It's, it's, a, it's a really exciting time to be like I am, a professor of artificial intelligence. Uh, when I started out, um, this was you know, before the Terminator franchise was really getting going, so we had a very rosy picture of, of artificial intelligence. And I started to dream about the time that we will build robots and intelligent machines. I read perhaps a little too much science fiction, but there's a good reason that science fiction is full of robots and intelligent machines, because they're clearly part of our future. And that future actually is arriving very quickly. This is a friend of mine, uh, Thomas Sandholm from CMU. Uh, I've got a long-running wager with him to see which of us is the worst squash player. Fortunately, my wager isn't to play poker, because a month or two back, his bot, his poker bot, beat some of the best poker players in the world. And that's just one of the examples. Every time you open the newspaper today, it seems that there's some spectacular advance that we're making in the field of AI. And we are making quite spectacular advances. Uh, almost a year ago to the day, um, we lost, mankind lost our pinnacle playing the ancient Chinese game of Go when Google's AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol in Korea. And Go Masters had said, we'd never win, never. That this was a really intuitive, human-like game, and that computers would never do it. And the Frenchman, Remy Coulton, who had written the best Go-playing program, Crazy Stone, up to that point, he'd said, oh, it's at least a decade away. So therefore, it was quite a landmark moment when we were able to, when computers were able to, to be the best human are playing this, this, this wonderfully old game of uh, strategy. So why is it happening now? I've got four exponentials I want to show you. The first exponential most of you are familiar with, that's Moore's Law. Now, there's two things I want to point out. First of all, I've plotted Moore's Law without, an ex well, without a logarithmic uh, scale. Normally, you see a straight line which is not as impressive as the graph you see be behind me, where we've, got the, where we've got a linear scale, and you see the true exponential. And you see how, how processing power, every 18 months, a doubling in the transistor count, is buying us all that wonderful computing power. Now, of course, officially, Intel have declared Moore's law is dead, but I actually have every faith in my hardware designer friends that they'll keep on with a little more ingenuity, uh, giving us more and more compute power using less and less power. So that's the first exponential. We're getting more and more compute power, which lets us do things that previously we just couldn't dream of. The second exponential, again, I've got an exponential curve up here, is the amount of data that we're getting. And again, that's roughly doubling every two years. That's going to be driven even further by things like the Internet of Things, the fact that we're all walking around with smartphones in our pockets. They're collecting all this data. All our enterprises are starting to realize the value that they have in the data. And so we're collecting more and more of that data. And that's giving us the ability, with, these, with, with more and more compute power, to do more and more. The third exponential is that we're getting better algorithms. The algorithms are actually improving, exponentially improving in their performance. Um, so this is, a, this is a graph here of um, error rates on ImageNet. That's the standard benchmark for, for image recognition used in, used in the AI community. Now, this probably doesn't look to you like an exponential. This looks like one of these linear curves again. But if you look at it closely, between 2011 and 2013, the error rate went from nearly 30%, 30, uh, 20 26% or so, down to 11 or 12%. That halved. And then down to 12, 2015, it went down to 5 or 6%. It halved again. So you see, though we're using error rates here, there's a doubling in performance, a halving in, in the error rate every two years or so. 
And the third exponential, unfortunately I haven't got a graph because I only saw this exponential yesterday, uh, was, is a, it's another doubling every two years. It's a doubling in the funding for AI. If you look at how much venture funds have gone into AI over the, over the last five years or so, it's 50% more every year. And it's now routine for large companies to invest a billion dollars into their AI efforts. And so not surprisingly, with all this money flowing into the field, uh, with lots of people being drawn into the field, the, uh, the academic field is certainly um, expanding very rapidly. We're going to see not only perhaps the same amount of progress that we've seen in the last 50 years of AI research, but maybe we'll actually see even an acceleration. So that means that you, if you're a CEO or CIO, you need an AI plan. 20 years ago, you needed an internet plan for your business. 10 years ago, you needed a mobile plan. And today, you've got to start thinking about, how is AI going to impact my business? And how am I going to stay in business if smart machines are going to start taking away some of those decisions? To understand what you have in that AI plan, you need to understand what AI can do, what AI can't do. And so I'm going to try and quickly help get you up to speed on that point. So what can AI do? Well, my colleague, Andrew Ning, who, well, I was going to say, he works at, is the chief AI researcher at Baidu, but he quit yesterday, so I'm not sure uh, what his official title is today. But anyway, he's been driving the thousand-odd people effort at Baidu into AI. And he has a very good rule of thumb that you need that tells you what you can do realistically with AI today. If it's a task that you can do without too much thought, something that you can subconsciously do, like ride a bicycle, or something that requires only a few seconds of thought, that's likely to be something that we can either do with AI today or with enough effort we could do very soon. We can still only do very narrow tasks. We still don't match human ability in the breadth of abilities that humans can do. But we can do narrow tasks. So a narrow task that you can do, everyone in this room pretty much can probably do, without any thought, without very much conscious thought, is drive down the highway. You can do that. You can, you can have a conversation. You can listen, listen to the radio. You can probably text, although you shouldn't. Right? So you can do something else while you're driving down the road, pretty much driving down the highway. And that's the sort of thing that, you know, very quickly, you know, you could buy yourself a Tesla today and it can pretty much do that. It can drive around the highway. It can't drive around town. Driving around town requires a bit more thought. You come to four-way intersections, roundabouts, you've got bicyclists, pedestrians who are going to step out into the road. Um, you know, you've got lots more. It's, it's much harder to... Um, to you know, subconsciously drive around town. There's more obstacles coming at you. Cars are coming in uh, from all directions. It's not a divided highway. So urban driving is still a more of a challenge. Highway driving, we've pretty much got, got off the pat already. Another example, serving up ads, these sorts of things. You know, if, if you know the person, if you know the domain, you can very quickly recommend a few products to someone. That's the sort of thing that, that Google and people are doing with AI tools today um, and doing it at a much more personal level than we've done perhaps previously in the past. Of course, we've had spectacular advances in playing a number of games of uh, a, a number of games that you and I think are challenging. This is a chessboard. This, in fact, is a very famous game. This is uh, Gary Kasparov playing Deep Blue. This fact is the second time he played Deep Blue, the second competition, 1997. Uh, Kasparov is black, Deep Blue is white. Anyone know who's, who's winning? Any, any choices? Black or white? White. White is, in fact, yes, winning. In fact, this was the final game. The scoreline was two and a half points apiece. Kasparov resigned on the next move. In fact, it's not too hard to see. If you, if you know anything about chess, you can see that, that uh, white has got a queen advantage over black, um, and Kasparov is about to, to call it quits. And that was, of course, the first time that uh, a grandmaster had been beaten by a computer way back in 1997. Here's a harder one. This is a game of Go. 
So if you don't know what Go is, it's a strategic game played on a 19 by 19 board. The idea is to occupy, surround as much territory with your color against the other person. Uh, this is a, another famous match. We've got Lisa Dole playing in white, one of the best players of, of, of Go on, on the planet today, playing AlphaGo, uh, Google's program playing black, the black, the black, uh, black stones. Anyone know who's winning? Much, much harder. You have to, you have to study uh, Go for years and years to get any idea. Any ideas? Yeah, I, know, I, I had no idea. I have played Go. I play Go very badly. It's much harder than chess, because in chess, you could just look at the pieces. Like, you, know, you could see that, that uh, the computer had a, a queen advantage. Here, there are all, the all the tokens are the same. They're either black or white stones. And it's all about subtle arrangement of position. In fact, this was the fourth game of the, f of the best of the, of the, of the five-game tournament where Lisa Dahl was beaten by AlphaGo. This is the fourth game where Lisa Dahl won. So in fact, um, White was about to win. Um, AlphaGo was about to resign. Um, so this was, this was mankind's victory against the computer before we went down 4-1. So that gives you a feel of the sorts of things that we can do. Very narrow specialized domains, the sorts of things especially that we can do without too much thought. What can't computers do? What should you realize that is still a long way away, it's still a challenge for us to do in AI, is that we can't learn like a human. So what I didn't tell you about that remarkable, impressive victory by Google, AlphaGo, was that AlphaGo was trained on billions and billions of games of Go. In fact, if you started playing Go, the moment you were born, and you only played Go the whole of your life, you wouldn't have played that many numbers of games of Go. In fact, if the whole of the audience only played Go the whole of their lives, you collectively would not have played as many games of Go as AlphaGo did. So AlphaGo learned, learned rather slowly, though, compared to us, to play Go, in fact, as well as and now significantly better than any human. And what's not often pointed out was that, was that fourth game, the one that I just showed you. That was a huge victory for mankind. Now, I'm claiming Lisa Dole's uh, uh, expertise for, for mankind, or for myself at least, because AlphaGo was playing a new type of Go. He, AlphaGo played moves that we'd never seen, that Go Master had never seen in the thousands of years that we played Go. In fact, Go Masters are pretty excited that this is going to open up a new way of playing Go. That it's new avenues, things that, that Go Masters had, had never thought were interesting moves, that were good ways of, of beginning the game of Go. So anyway, AlphaGo was playing a new type of Go. And it played a move, you know, played moves at the start that, that uh, surprised Lisa Dole. But it only took Lisa Dole three games of that new type of Go for him to learn enough about playing Go that he was actually able to win the fourth match. So we're immensely quick learners, especially compared to the AI, the deep learning uh, that we do today. We have to be. It's, it's really baked into our DNA. If you're being chased by a, a tiger in the jungle, you don't have time to be a slow learner. We're very quick at learning from small data sets. And still today, we're very challenged in our computers to learn from small data sets. What else can't we do yet? Well, we can't act completely autonomously. This uh, shot here is the car wreck for Joshua Brown's Tesla. Joshua Brown has made himself famous as being the first guy killed by his autonomous car. Uh, last year, he was driving along in Florida. No, he wasn't driving along. The Tesla was driving along. Drove into a truck that was turning across the road. He invested too much faith in the technology. It's claimed, in fact, he was watching a, a Harry Potter movie at the time, and he should have been paying attention. We still can't give full control to the cars. And actually, there's a point for the regulators here. If these were drugs, we wouldn't let people test them on the public roads or on the public as, as willingly as we do allow autonomous 
companies like Tesla to test their autonomous vehicles on public roads, in amongst the public, pedestrians, cyclists, and so on. And in the race to govern that next billion dollar industry, the autonomous car industry, I believe the regulators are not doing their job properly. That we do have to think about how these, that this technology is being prototyped and developed and the risks about the public. The end point is a fantastic one. Several thousand people will die on the roads of Germany in the next year because of car accidents. 95% of those car accidents are caused by driver error. The sooner we can get the human out of the loop, the better. But we have to get to that point in a safe way. If these were aircraft, we wouldn't let people introduce new technology and risk people's lives um, in any way. But for some reason, the car industry, or the autonomous car industry, has been given a free ride here. In, because it is a billion dollar industry, it's not clear that it's going to be Daimler, Mercedes, Ford, General Motors, who are going to be making cars in 10 years' time. It could be Tesla, Apple, and Google. In the race to win this, in this race to win this business, People are forgetting that this is still technology that's under development and still will make risks, it will still make mistakes, and there's still some way before we have full autonomy. What else can't AI do? AI can't eliminate discrimination. Another issue that I have with the technology companies is the lie that we've been sold by companies like Google and Facebook, which is that the algorithms are unbiased. Algorithms are just as biased as you and I. If we're not careful, they will have all the biases that we have. They may be trained on data that will have explicit or implicit biases that we may be aware of or not even aware of. There's a wonderful example of this in the United States where the Compass program is being used by judges in 20 of the 52 states to help decide sentencing decisions, decide parole conditions. That program was shown by ProPublica to be racially biased, to be more likely to predict that black people would reoffend than they will, and to more likely predict that white people will not reoffend than they will. And that as a consequence, black people are being locked up because of a bug in a machine learning program. We have to be very careful that we don't bake in the same biases that we have in our human society into our algorithms. What else can't I do? One thing that people always worry about, and I try and dissuade them, it's first of all, potentially a very long way away, and potentially not even a problem at all, is that the robots are going to take over. Machines have no sentience, no consciousness, no desires. AlphaGo is not going to wake up tomorrow and say, you know what, humans, you're no good at Go, because we can, the machines can beat us at Go now. I'm going to make some money at online poker. And it's certainly not going to wake up and say, you know what, I'm bored of winning money at online poker or beating you humans at Go. I'm going to take over the planet. It's not in its code. Its code is only ever going to play Go. In fact, it's never even going to play chess. It would take man years of effort to get it to play chess. There's no possibility, no, no chance at all that it's going to wake up and say, I'm going to take over the planet. One thing that we should be worried about is stupid AI being put into the battlefield. Thousands of my colleagues signed an open letter that I helped put together uh, two years ago calling upon the United Nations to act on this issue, to think about whether we wanted what are called lethal autonomous weapons in the battlefield. What we're worried about are a number of things. First of all is the fact that the weapons today would be very stupid. They wouldn't be able to behave ethically, to, be ha to, to follow international humanitarian law, to, act discrimi to discriminate between combatants and civilians, to act proportional to the threat, all things that are required by the Geneva Convention. And that they would, there would be an arms race. We actually already see that arms race happening today. The US DOD has $18 billion in its current budget to develop the next generation of weapon systems, most of which will be autonomous. It's a frightening prospect to see, especially stupid AI, put in the battlefield, the way that this will destabilize our current system, our current geopolitical order. I'm pleased to say that the UN is acting, as acting as quickly as the UN does on these sorts of things, 
In August this year, there will be formal discussions starting for the first time. Uh, a group of governmental experts will, will begin discussing this issue. But it's happening very slowly. That Pandora's box will be opened very soon. And we want that to be very hard to put the lid back on. So I encourage you to bring this matter up with your political representatives, uh, with your national governments, with the European Parliament and elsewhere, that we have a moment. Occasionally, we have a moment as a society to decide a technology would be a better one to be used for good ends, not for bad ends, to be used to develop autonomous cars, to make our roads safer, to, make, uh, to give uh, mobility to the elderly, the disabled, the young, um, to transform our cities in a positive way and not to use pretty much the same technology to build autonomous tanks, autonomous drones, and to make the battlefield a much more terrible, terrifying place. Technologies that won't just stay in the hands of the US military, that will fall into the hands of terrorist organizations and rogue nations and be used as weapons of terror against innocent people. Something else that you should be concerned about is the impact they will have on unemployment. Now, who has an odd birthday? Well, I should tell you what an odd, odd birthday means. You were born on an odd numbered day of the month. I was born on the 11th of April. 11 is an odd number. So who has an odd birthday? Come on, come on. I know it's half the room. Right? It's half the room. I know that for sure, right? In fact, you want to have an odd birthday. You are the lucky people, right? You're the lucky person because if you believe the chief economist of the Bank of England and a lot of other economists, you will be the person with a job in 20 years' time. November the 13th, uh, a year and a half ago, the chief economist of the Bank of England, who you think would know something about where employment is going, made the prediction that half of all jobs in the UK were under threat from automation. Similar estimates have been made for the US, for other countries in Europe and, and elsewhere in the developed world. Unfortunately, November the 13th, there was some terrible news breaking in Paris at the time, so maybe it didn't get you. But you should be very aware of the threat that automation has on people's livelihoods. Now, the fact that 50% of jobs are at risk of automation doesn't mean that we're going to have 50% unemployment. Technologies create new jobs as well as destroy old jobs. In the past, technology has already always created more jobs than it's destroyed. If we go back to the last big technological change, the Industrial Revolution, most of us were working out in the fields, farming before then. But new jobs have been created in factories and, and, and offices. And actually only 3% now, instead of half of us, are working out in, in agriculture. And most of us do jobs in, in factories and offices today. Technology has created a lot many more jobs. The population's got a lot bigger. Unemployment levels are historically low levels. So technology has created opportunity, gr driven growth, and produced wealth, as we would hope it would. But there's a real fear this time may be different. Previously, we had one thing left for us, the th our brains, the things that are cognitive tasks. You know, our manual tasks were being automated, but our cognitive tasks were less. Once our cognitive tasks get automated, there's a real question what's going to be left. And there's one thing that we're pretty certain about, which is that even if new jobs get created that fill all of the technological change, those new jobs are almost certainly going to require new skills. If you're a taxi driver or a truck driver, your job is at risk from automation. It's going to be much cheaper. Uber have made their intentions very clear in September last year when they started trialing autonomous taxis on the roads of Pittsburgh that they want to get the most expensive component out of their taxi, that's the taxi driver. And they want to scale like every other internet business by not having to worry about employing and finding expensive humans. And so if you're a taxi driver, your job is a risk. I mean, there's, I find it, you know, there's some rather nice irony that the newest job on the planet, Uber driver, is probably going to be the shortest job lived planet, a job on the planet, being an Uber driver. That's probably going to be automated almost quicker than any other job. But I'd like to end not on this negative note, because I like to remind people of all the benefits 
that the price of taxes is going to plummet. All of us are going to be able to use taxes like we use buses in the future. It's going to give mobility to the handicapped, the disabled, the elderly. It's going to open up our cities. Most of our cities are used for parking. They won't be used for parking when the autonomous cars can go off and, and do other things. They can go and earn money for you. In fact, you won't probably own a car anymore. You'll just have time on some app. But the point, the, the take-home message for you is that the technology is morally neutral. And we are at a junction in history where we get to decide whether it's used for good or for bad. And if it gets used for good, it has the great potential to make us healthier, to make us wealthier, and perhaps to make us happier. But we just have to make some good choices today to go down the right road, to use the technology to, to all those ends. So thank you very much.